All right, well, Suzanne gave me quite the introduction uh, tonight, didn't she? And I did leave my fiddle at home, so uh, too bad there won't be a uh, fiddle off tonight. And you know, I'm a lot older now than I was when I clogged, and I'm not sure that everything will like stay in the right place if I do any uh, bouncing up here. So uh, Suzanne has revealed all my childhood secrets to you now. Um, And so tonight I probably won't be doing any fiddling or clogging, but that might be a little bit easier than what we are gonna talk about tonight, and that's relationships. So you hear that and you either groan, roll your eyes, or you clap, because let's, let's be honest, ladies, relationships can be the most encouraging, meaningful, wonderful part of our lives. But if we're honest, they're hard. They can be really hard. And even the best relationships can be challenging. Uh, It doesn't take much long to find yourself in the middle of conflict. Well, I am the mom to twin boys, uh, Beckett and Eli. And so I am no stranger to relational conflict in my house. Even starting in the womb, they had some wrestling punching action going on in there. And so even though they're super close and they're best of friends, there are times when they have just had it with each other. And so it normally starts when they're up in the playroom and I'm downstairs and so they're up playing. And so I listen for the sounds that are going and I may hear you know, a scream or a bump or a thud and then I wait to see if someone's gonna cry, see how that goes, give it a little bit longer to determine if they're gonna work it out for themselves or if the parental police is gonna need to come upstairs and get involved. And so one time last summer, man, summer is hard. They are like so crazy and so bored and it's like breeding ground for sibling squabbles. And so things started to escalate and uh, it went from the crying to then I heard like some thuds and some running around. It sounds like we might be throwing things. And so I start making my way up the stairs and then I hear them start screaming. you're the worst brother ever. You're a crybaby. I'm going to kill you. And so down, like running as fast as I can at this point. And I top the stairs and they are both squared off. One of them has on a catcher's baseball mask and is holding a golf club. And the other one has on a, has a baseball bat and is standing on the other side and they are swinging like their lives dependent on it. And so I'm like screaming, get them to stop. But they're so locked in on each other. Like their brother's demise is like the only thing that they have on their mind. So I had to walk right in between them, risking life and limb to bring peace in the situation, to get right in the middle of conflict. And that's where our girl Abigail finds herself in our passage tonight, right in the middle of conflict. One man, her husband Nabal, who is described as cruel and hard-hearted, and another man, the future king of Israel, the hot-headed man known as David. And so Abigail's story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 25. If you want to take your Bibles out and follow along, it is kind of a lengthy story. So I'm going to do some summarizing and then we'll kind of go back and highlight some parts of the passages. But her story is found in 1 Samuel 25 and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So when we meet Abigail, David, the future king, is no king at all at this point. Samuel has anointed David, but Saul is still king. And relationships between Saul and David had gone south. David was on the run from Saul. Saul was in a jealous rage, determined to kill David. And six times he tried to kill David. And six times David eluded him. So David finds himself living out in the wilderness like a gypsy, like a vagabond with a group of 600 men on the run from Saul. Now the wilderness of these areas kind of south of the Dead Sea were known for these wild tribes or bandits or muggers who would attack local farmers or livestock, sheep, shepherds, um, and try to rummage uh, small villages. So while David and his men were living out in the wilderness, they formed sort of like a neighborhood watch party. And so they were watching over the fields protecting these shepherds. And one of the fields that they were protecting was owned by a man named Nabal. So it's customary for these neighborhood watch groups to get paid. 
a little bit of a tip, sort of like you're tipping a waiter. So when it comes time to shear the sheep, normally the farmer or the owner of the field would give a portion of that profit to the people who were guarding the fields. And so this field, guarded by Nabal, David hears that Nabal is shearing his sheep. And so he gets 10 of his men together and he sends them to Nabal. And he makes a really reasonable request. He doesn't ask for too much. He says, whatever extra that you have, we've kept your your field safe. You'll notice that nothing is missing. We haven't stolen anything. We've kept it safe. Uh, We would just like to have a little bit extra of what you have. And he is about to find out that Nabal is not a reasonable man. So the 10 men go to Nabal, and Nabal answers the servants like this. He says, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Should I just take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and just give it to men who come from I don't know where? Y'all, who is David? Nabal knew who David was. I mean, he was notorious because just a few years he had slayed the giant Goliath. Everyone knew who David was. And so he was insulting David. More than that, though, he goes in for the kill shot because he accuses him of being a traitor to the king of Israel. Now we see how Nabal gets his reputation for being hard-hearted. There is some conflict brewing right here. So David's men take the answer back to David and tell David what Nabal said. And David responds by saying, every man strap on your sword. By tomorrow morning, there will be no males left in the house of Nabal. David had had it. He was ticked off. He's hungry. He's exhausted. He thought he'd done this man a favor. And then somewhere out of the blue, he acts like a lunatic and decides to offend him. David is done. He is out for blood. He is coming for Nabal. He has 400 men and he's coming to their household. There is doom impending for the house of Nabal. He has put an army into motion. But behind the scenes, one of Nabal's servants who witnessed the entire interaction go down between Nabal and David's men, goes to Abigail, Nabal's wife, and tells her what's happened. So let's make sure we don't miss this because Nabal's men went to Abigail. Nabal makes a decision, sends off crazy insults to David, and his servants go straight for Abigail, the wife. Get the impression this is probably not the first time that Abigail has had to deal with the consequences of her husband's decisions and intervene to make things happen, but the stakes this time are high, and a woman is about to save the day. Ah, don't you love it when that happens? So Abigail springs into action, and she doesn't waste any time. She gets grains and wine and sheep and raisins and figs, and she loads them up on donkey, and she sends them out to David. And she doesn't tell her husband Nabal. I think we know why they call her wise now. Abigail rides out on her donkey through the mountain until she comes face to face with David. And in what is the speech of her lifetime? In fact, one of the longest documented recorded speeches of a woman in the Bible, she gets off her donkey, she falls on her face before David, she pleads for the life of her people, and David listens. He calls off the army. Abigail saves the day. I love this story. And so Abigail, God uses her in such an incredible way. She brings peace in the middle of this conflict. She spares the lives of hundreds of people. And what we're going to see is not only that, she challenges David to be the kind of man and king that God created him to be. Abigail's story has so much to teach us. It's a remarkable story about what to do when we inevitably find ourselves faced with relational conflict. So I want to look at three truths that we can find in Abigail's story tonight. So if you're a note taker, here we go. The first truth is this, that our faithfulness is not dependent on our circumstances. That our faithfulness is not dependent on our circumstances. So let's talk about Abigail and Nabal's marriage for a minute. We know that Nabal was a very wealthy man, but his name in Hebrew literally meant fool. 
And in Hebrew, that doesn't mean simple-minded or not smart. That means a person who lives like there is no God. And so she is married to a man who lives like there is no God. I cannot imagine that this was an easy relationship for her. Can you imagine the hurt that she probably had felt from him, the wounds or the cruelty or the hard-heartedness that he had expressed to her throughout the relationship? How many insults do you think that she had been sent her way? How many times do you think that she prayed, God, what are you doing here? Can't you change this? Why am I married to this man? But here is Abigail in this story described as wise and discerning and intelligent and beautiful inside and out. There is no indication that her difficult relationship has hardened her heart or affected her character, or prompted her to justify or make excuses for bad behavior. In fact, we have every indication that despite her difficult situation, Abigail has been faithful to run her household in a way that's garnered respect. I mean, Nabal's servant was facing death, and he went to Abigail and trusted her with his life. She did not allow her difficult marriage to a cruel and mean man to affect her faithfulness. In the faith of adversity and challenges, she remained good and smart and wise. And I don't know about you, but I am floored by that. I am challenged by that because I know how easy it is for me to get pulled into the negativity of a hard or difficult relationship, to become bitter or to start harboring up unforgiveness in my heart when I'm hurt or I'm wronged in a relationship, or to want to hurt back, and how I allow relationships sometimes to affect my behavior. Um, my, If I'm honest, in one place it's with my spouse. Um, So my spouse and I, my husband and I are very much alike. And you would think that this would make for a easier, peaceful marriage because we're so much alike. But in fact, it doesn't because we're alike in the way that we are both controlling and headstrong and strong-willed. And we're both always right. Uh, If you're an Enneagram junkie, uh, we are both eights on the Enneagram, which means we are challengers. And so we really challenge each other. And this uh, really reared its head for the first time. Uh, It's been 13 years that we're married, and it's still a challenge. But it was particularly bad when we were first married. We had no idea what we were getting into. And we moved in together. And so one of our ways of dealing with displeasure about the way the other person handled household chores or responsibilities was to just sort of like up the stakes and pay them back. And so he hated the way that I left my hair dryer and my toiletries and my makeup and all my stuff out on the kitchen, uh, out on the bathroom sink. Like he asked me over and over again, could you just put that stuff up when you get done? Because when I use the sink, I don't want it out everywhere. And of course I'm like, I mean, it's my sink and you don't understand like taking it all out, putting it back up, taking it all out, putting it back up every day. Ain't nobody got time for that. And so one day I came home to find that he had just like swept it all off the kit, all off the bathroom counter into like a big pile in the closet floor. He's like, I'm sorry, if you can't put it up, this is where it's going to be every day when you get home. And I was like, oh, Really? Really, because you know what I hate? I hate when you leave your laundry all over the floor. I hate when you walk in the house and take off your belt and then take off your jacket and take everything is like this trail of clothes all over the house. And then you finally make it to the bedroom to finish changing and you put them on the floor right beside the basket, like right beside it. So the next time he did, I got out my trash bag. And I just put all the clothes that were on the floor in the trash bag and tied it up and put it out in the garbage. See? Yep, that's what happened. And you can see how things can just get really out of hand when you respond this way to being treated, when you respond by trying to get the other person back. It can get really out of hand. And so I don't know about you, if you think about a difficult or challenging relationship, maybe you have one in your life too. Maybe it is your spouse. Maybe it's your ex-spouse. Maybe it's your in-laws or your, maybe it's your child who's just like stretching you on the daily. 
Maybe it's a friend, or I've been in this situation before. Maybe it's your boss who just makes coming to work every day a challenge. And here's the thing. Those kind of relationships can just drive us to be bitter or to be hardened or to want to like pay back that hurt that we felt with more hurt. But the thing about Abigail is when she heard what Nabal had done, when she heard what David was going to do, how easy would it have been for her to be like, oh, this is my chance. I don't have to do anything. This is freedom for me. All I have to do is sit back and do nothing. And David is going to take care of this situation with Nabal for me. I don't have to do anything. Nabal, make no mistake, is getting what he deserves. He trash talked a warrior king. And a warrior king is coming for him. And Abigail, All she had to do was nothing. This could have been a moment that led to her freedom, but she could not remain silent. She made the choice to do good. Despite her circumstances, despite everything she'd been through in the relationship, she chose to be faithful and good and do what was right in God's eyes. She repaid evil with good. She repaid evil with good in her relationship with Nabal. She paid evil with good in this situation. And she calls David to do the same thing. When she rides out to David, she says in her speech, David, let the fools like Nabal repay evil with evil. You, David, you are called to more and greater because you belong to God. Repay evil with good. Love your enemies. Let the Lord handle them. You, David, are called to do good. And so for those of us who belong to God, we are called to operate in a radically different loving way, to love the people who hurt us, to do good to the people who wound us, to repay evil with good because we belong to God. And so I want to encourage you tonight that if you are in a hard and difficult relationship, I just want to encourage you to continue to do good, continue to be faithful despite your circumstances. Abigail's story shows us that we can honor God, that we can be faithful despite our circumstances. The second truth found in Abigail's story is this. A humble heart is a game changer for our relationships. A humble heart is a game changer for our relationships. It is so easy to see pride in this story, isn't it? You can see it in a ball who's like, oh, who's David? I don't need David. I can take care of myself. I don't need to pay that guy. And then you can see it in David who's like, it's on, buddy. You think you're going to offend the king, of, the king of Israel? You don't know who David is? I'm about to show you who David is. See the pride, right? It's so easy to see. It's right here in the story. But I wonder... How easy it is for us to see pride in our own relationships? How easy it is for us to see pride in our own hearts? Because there is pride that lurks in our heart that can derail any of our relationships at any moment. You know how I can spot it in my own life? I can spot pride in my relationships when I start thinking about what I've done right in the relationship and what the other person has done wrong. And I can spot pride in my relationships when I start keeping this sort of like checks and balances of how much I've done for them, how much they haven't (laughs) done for me in return. And I can spot pride in my heart and my relationships when I find myself thinking about the decisions that we should make. They should be about what I want and what I feel and what's good for me. That's how the decision should be made. And I can find myself with pride in my heart when I think things like, how dare he? How dare he criticize the way I match his socks? He needs to get down on his knees today and thank the Lord that he has a wife that does laundry. Amen? (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. It's pride. Pride can lead us right into conflict with others because we're only thinking about ourselves. And I love it when this whole situation is brewing 
It's a servant that goes to Abigail, a servant with no authority over the household, a servant that she could have easily dismissed because of his low lot in life. But he comes to her and he talks to her about what's happening. And you know what? She listens. She listens to someone who on all accounts is below her and beneath her. And she could have easily dismissed him and been like, look, this is none of your business. We got the household under control, but she didn't. She humbled herself. She listened to her words. And then when she made the decision to go out to David, she was selfless. She was not thinking about herself or putting herself in harm by any stretch of the imagination. And so try to picture this, okay? There are 400 armed, angry, starving, upset men coming towards her. She is a lone, unarmed woman on a donkey. She is the enemy. And she is riding right up to them. They could have killed her easily. And she gets face to face with David and she sees him. And it tells us that she gets down from the donkey and she doesn't just bow to him. No, she falls on her face to the ground. Verse 23 says, when Abigail saw David, she hurried, got down from the donkey, fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and she said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Verse 27, she says, And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespasses of your servant. She comes and presents herself as David's servant. And you have to remember, she is a high-ranking, super wealthy woman. She is used to people showing her respect. But she brought humility She went low. She took blame upon herself for something that wasn't her fault at all. She humbled herself before David. And David responds to this. In verse 35, he said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. He responds to her humility with humility. Abigail's willingness to go low, Abigail's willingness to humble herself before him disarms David's pride. Her humility gets him to respond as humility. David's heart is full of pride and it's wounded and it's hurt from lack of respect, reeling from being offended, wanting to take revenge, and he is stopped cold in his tracks by this woman's incredible display of humility. Humility was a game changer in this situation, and it is a game changer in our relationships. When we are willing to go low, when we are willing to serve one another, when we are willing to put other people before us, it changes our relationships. There are relationships, if you are struggling with a relationship, I encourage you, look for humility. It's hard, y'all. Pride is our flesh and it is our natural reaction. But when we go low, when we bring humility, it can change the nature of our relationships. Okay, so the first truth was that we can be faithful despite our circumstances. The second truth was that a humble heart is a game changer for our relationships. And the third truth of Abigail's story is this. God can use us in the lives of others for his purposes. God can use us in the lives of others for his purposes. There is no doubt that Abigail was brave and courageous to act in this situation, to go around her husband, to ride out to see David, took incredible strength and courage. But Abigail does more than save her people. She brings a message from God. And she challenges the future king of Israel. We're going to look at Abigail's speech, and it is a powerful example of the way God uses people to speak words of life and truth into other people. 
Abigail, after humbling herself before him, begins to speak into David's future, calling him to be the man that God created him to be. In verse 26, it says, Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt, from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespasses of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of the sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pains or conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation for himself. When the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Abigail says, David, this pride thing that you've got going on, that's for fools. That's not for you. That's not who God created you to be. She said, David, remember God gave you a promise that your house would endure. And he is calling you. Live up to your calling, David. You are held tightly in God's hands, but your enemies are going to be thrown like a stone from a sling. When was the last time a stone was hurled from a sling? It was when David defeated Goliath. She is challenging to remember that the work that God started in him is not finished. That God has called him and purposed him and created him to be a king. And David, you don't want this bloodshed on your hands when you become king. You don't want the guilt of this. You are made to be king and you are entrusted with a calling and the Lord is fighting your battles for you, David. You don't have to work for your own salvation. The Lord is fighting fighting for you. Y'all, she's just not looking for meaningless niceties just to make David feel good. She is speaking to David on God's behalf. She is speaking words of life and truth, and she is courageously challenging David to be the man that God has created him to be. So when the boys were 10 weeks old, I went back to work, and it was the hardest probably one of the hardest, darkest seasons of my life. They weren't sleeping yet, <laughs> but I still had to go to work, and I was exhausted. And we, we had a hard time getting back to church, but I remember one of the first uh, Sundays that we made it back, I was nervous to turn the boys over, um, but I was also sort of looking forward to some adult time, uh, and so we checked the boys in, and then we went to our Sunday school class. And uh, we were sitting in our Sunday school class. We hadn't been there very long when I got the call that, that I needed to come get one. So I go and get him, and I come back up to the room, and I, like, stand outside the door. And I'm like, you know what, Lord? I can't do it. I can't take him in here. I can't try to make him quiet. I'm just going to, like, call it a wash for today, and I'm just going to sit here on this bench and wait on everybody to get done. So I'm sitting here with the baby, and this woman comes, and she sits beside me, and she was older than me, and she was very nice. She was making small talk, looking at the baby. And as she talked to me, she looked me in the eyes, and she said, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> and I just lost it. I was just like sobbing on this woman. <laughs> I'm like, it's so hard. And I'm telling her like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so inadequate to do this. Uh, they need more from me than I can give. My husband needs me. I go to work and my staff needs me. And I was like, I am a failure on all fronts at this point. And so she was very kind, and she told me a story about when her kids were young, and she said, you know, I don't have all the answers. She's like, sometimes it's just day by day, trusting God, doing the best that you can do. She said, but I do know this. It is by no accident that you are their mom. 
It is by no accident that you are the mom to those two boys. God created you to be their mother. He purposed them for you. And there is no person in this world who could love them or care for them better than you. Trust God. Walk faithfully with him. And I promise you as a mom, God will never fail you and he will never fail them. That day, God placed her right in my path to speak purpose to me, to speak truth to me, to get me to take my eyes off myself and start trusting him again. And I can't tell you how many times in the last eight years that I have found myself feeling inadequate again, like I'm failing again, like I can't do this mom thing. And her words always come back to me. God chose me. That is speaking life and truth. And I think sometimes we think that speaking truth into someone is telling it like it is or um, giving a piece of our mind or being confrontational. But what we see in Abigail's story, that the essence of speaking your truth is not about just telling someone your mind. It's about speaking into them. It's about telling them who God created them to be and challenging them to be that person. And a humble heart, like we just talked about, a humble heart is absolutely necessary to speak this kind of life or truth into someone. Because a humble heart can speak without accusation, without condemnation, and tell someone, you are too amazing for this. God has created you for more. And that takes a lot of boldness and a lot of courage and a lot of peacemaking to speak God's words of life and truth to one another. Abigail, she saves the lives of her household, but she also breathes life into David's wayward soul, reminding him that, David, deep down, you know who God created you to be, and it's not this. David responds to Abigail and he says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. He looks past Abigail and he sees that God sent you. David heard from God that day. And God used Abigail not only to bring peace, not only to save hundreds of lives, but to turn David from his sin and back to him. So after this successful interceding with David, The story tells us that she returns home to find Nabal drunk, partying, totally oblivious that he was about to die. And so she decides to wait until he sobers up. That's wisdom to tell him what happened. So verse 37 tells us that in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, and that's really in the Bible, y'all. When the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult that I have received at the hand. Don't y'all love David? He is so imperfectly messed up, but still great. Uh, And has kept this servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. And then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. Yep, sure did. Uh, So you see, God had a plan for Abigail this whole time to use her gifts and her strengths her obedience and her faithfulness, a plan to rescue and redeem her. And he has a plan for you too. Now, I can't promise you that it's to turn your husband's heart to stone and marry you off to a king, but hey, you know, a girl can dream, right? (laughs) Sometimes I think that life would be so much more simple without relationships. But we weren't created that way. We were created to thrive in relationship and community with others. Just like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit thrive in community and exist in community, so do we. God uses our relationships. And Abigail's story shows us that even in the difficult ones, we can be faithful, we can be humble, we can honor God with our choices, 
God is using the people around us to teach us and refine us and to reveal pride and to humble us and to make us more like him, challenging us and calling us to be the people that God created us to be. And you see, when I think about Abigail riding on that donkey to merciless judgment, all the while that Nabal is having meaningless pleasures, totally oblivious to his doom and death and destruction. I want to be Abigail in this story. I want to be wise and right and true. But the Bible tells us of another who rode on a donkey, who humbled himself while we were being greedy and selfish and prideful and destined for destruction. And Jesus stood between us and certain death and went low in humility and sacrificed himself for us so that our old sinful life could be buried and we could be raised to new life. Jesus rushed to save us. And when you see him, when you realize the humility and how low he went for us, with that reality and that vision, then we can also be humble in our relationships too. We can walk with him. We can be faithful with him. And he's going to give us everything we need for our relationships. Jesus stood for us and we can stand for others, and we can speak life and truth into others. So as we close tonight and we move into prayer, I want you to think about your relationships. Maybe it's a relationship. Do think about what we've talked about tonight. Is there somewhere that you can do good in your relationship? Is there a way that you can humble yourself in that relationship? Or is God calling you to speak life and truth into someone? Ladies, I am so thankful to be part of community here at Faith Bridge, and we can be different. It's what I love about God. He brings us all together, and he gives us what we need to be the kind of people who speak life and truth into each other. And so tonight, as we pray, as we go before the Lord, Let's ask him to help us be light and truth in a world that so desperately needs it. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for the story of David and Naval and Abigail. I continue to be amazed at these stories that are included for our benefit, God, that show the sinful nature that we all have so clearly. And God, it's easy to look at the story and say, this is what Nabal was wrong with Nabal, and this is what was wrong with David, and to not look at our own heart or our own sin. And so tonight, right now, as a community, as a body, we just want to confess to you, Lord, that we are prideful, that it lurks in our heart and it shows up in our relationships, and that, God, we're tempted to not pay evil with good, but to return hurt for hurt. And so, God, we are desperate for you. We are desperately in need of you to intercede for us, to stand in the gap for us, God. And we are so thankful. If there is anyone here tonight who has not trusted in Jesus, who has not put to death their sinful life. I pray right now, just tell the Lord, I surrender. I am a sinner and I want to walk with you, Lord. And I pray that as a body of believers, as a group of women, that we would speak words of life and truth and we would continue to call each other to be the uniquely wonderful, amazing woman that God created each person in this room to be. God, thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. Thank you that we get to walk with you. Help us do it with humility. Help us to be faithful. In your precious son name we pray, amen. All right, let's worship together.